Hi, good morning, and welcome to our STEM series. Uh, I'm Brian Kurth. I teach in the mathematics department. And I'm delighted to welcome our first STEM speaker for the semester. Uh, STEM, in case you don't know, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And our speaker today is Dr. David Noh, who has a PhD in biology from Purdue University. And he currently works uh, for Cornell University. And today he will speak on X-ray crystallography. So let's give a warm welcome to our speaker, uh, Dr. David Noh. Thank you. So good morning and thank you for coming. I'd like to thank Troy and Brian for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, today what I'm going to do is try and give you an introduction to the technique called X-ray crystallography and how we use it to visualize protein structures. Um, and just because I know it's a broad uh, background in the audience, I want to try and keep it really lightweight and uh, just a broad overview of it. So I'm not going to dive too deeply. Hopefully I don't lose anyone along the way. So I do work for Cornell University, um, but I actually work at Argonne National Lab, okay? So here's Moraine Valley, about nine miles to the west is Argonne National Lab. So you might wonder, okay, what's a Cornell employee doing uh, outside of New York, all the way over here in uh, so for, To kind of explain that, I'm gonna just give you a brief introduction to Argonne and some of the things that they do there, all right? So this is an overhead view of Argonne's campus. Uh, it was established in 1946 as the first national laboratory, and it's funded by the Department of Energy. Initially, its primary research was in nuclear reactors, and it was an outgrowth of the um, Manhattan Project that was uh, conducted during World War II. And as part of that, they were interested in nuclear reactors, and Argonne started off uh, sort of that as their primary mission. Uh, currently, their mission now focuses on renewable energy, uh, s security, and the environment. So uh, a lot of times you might hear, if you, if you do hear them about Argonne in the news, it's usually with their renewable energy uh, where they work, are working on uh, improving batteries for automotives, uh, the automotive industry. <clears throat> there are 15 different research divisions at Argonne that support this uh, mission focus. And you can think of these as departments at a university. So they have a biology department, there's a physics division, there's a chemistry division as well. And those divisions are all Argonne employees and they do independent research to support the mission of Argonne, okay? But also at Argonne, they have five national user facilities. So what a national user facility is, these are large research facilities that have resources that would be too expensive for an individual university to put all the funding for on their own. And so the national government has stepped in, provided funding for these user facilities, and in return what they do is they open up the access to any researchers within the U.S., and in fact, uh, internationally as well. And so there are five different research facilities. There's the uh, tan uh, Argonne Tandem Linear Accelerator System, this is a physics machine, allows them to study the structure of atomic nuclei and really dig into that. Uh, the Center for Nanoscale Materials um, deals with creating, imaging, and manipulating structures at the nanoscale level, so nanometers to 100 nanometers. The uh, Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, it's shown here as the uh, Mira supercomputer. This is sort of their core of their facility there. And it's a large, uh, it can do 10 petaflop calculations, which it just means it can do a lot of calculations really fast. And so it's used primarily for doing large simulations over long periods of time. Okay. And then the Transportation Research and Analysis Computing Center is another uh, user facility that's focused around computing resources. And in this case, what they mainly use it is for transportation research. So they, they do simulations of traffic flow patterns. For example, if for some reason you needed to evacuate Chicago, what's the best way to go about doing that? So they've done that simulation and, and you can access that. They also do simulations on fluid dynamic flows. How does water during a flood flow around the structures of bridges and whether or not that's gonna damage the bridge, okay? And then finally, we're going to get to uh, the advanced photon source, which is the uh, facility that I work at. Okay, so this is just an overhead view of the advanced photon source. 
to give you an idea of the scale, it's about 1,000 feet across the infield here. And that would allow you to put the entirety of U.S. cellular field right in the middle of that ring. Okay? What the advanced photon source is, is just a large machine used to generate x-rays. Okay? <clears throat> and this is of the, the APS. Uh, and basically it's divided into 35 sectors. And th those are shown in the different colors kind of coming off as wedges. And each sector essentially operates as a, special, a separate lab specializing in a particular technique. Okay? So in addition to what I do, there, there are people who do um, x-ray absorption techniques, uh, there are x-ray transmission techniques, and uh, various visualization of, of uh, components with x-rays. Okay? I work at Sector 24, which is located back over here in the back side here. It's called ANYCAT, which is short for Northeastern Collaborative Access Team. So some of these sectors are run by Argonne employees. They're, they're part of the Argonne Research Divisions. Other sectors, like ANYCAT, uh, are what are called Collaborative Access Teams. And what these are is that Argonne uh, built the APS to provide x-rays, but then these sectors came up with the funding to, to build out the, the instrumentation needed to utilize those x-rays for the technique that they're interested in. And so at, 20, at ANYCAT, what we specialize in is called x-ray crystallography. So that's sort of my brief overview of uh, how I came to be working at Argonne. Uh, and the reason I work for Cornell is because one of the universities involved in this collaborative access team is Cornell University, and they're sort of the uh, govern the funding for it. So the funding runs from the National Institutes of Health to Cornell, and they employ me and the rest of my colleagues at ANYCAT. Okay, so I, in the title I said we, we're shining a light on proteins. So what, what exactly do I mean when I talk about proteins? So generally in our everyday life, if someone tells you, talks about proteins, what you think about is food, you, the nutrients you get. So fish, eggs, meat, that kind of thing. But for a biologist, what we're actually interested in are large biological molecules, and they, what they carry out many functions within the cell. So the reason we call these foods proteins is because they're, they have a high concentration of these biological molecules. But these, uh, so just as an example of some of the things that these uh, molecules do, they can have uh, structural functions in cells. So here I have a picture of an impala with uh, the horns, or the rigidity of those horns are dictated by a protein molecule called keratin. This is the same protein that's found in your hair, so it's a really high resilient molecule. Um, and then I also show here, you know, someone flexing their muscles. Everybody's sort of familiar with that striation within the muscles, and that striation is actually because of protein fibers that are found inside the muscle and provide that structure in, in the movement. Uh, proteins can also be involved in transport, whether that's through the body. For example, red blood cells have a protein called hemoglobin that uh, uh, binds to oxygen, transports it to your cell releases the oxygen there and picks up carbon dioxide, brings it back to your lungs. And so you circulate those two molecules throughout your body. Uh, also down at a more molecular level, uh, so what we have here is a membrane from a cell, and it's showing a, two different types of proteins. You can have uh, protein, uh, protein channels. Basically, this just allows ions to move freely between the extracellular and intracellular space. Or you can have carrier proteins, which use energy to actually actively pump ions or other small molecules across the cell membrane. Okay. Proteins can also be uh, catalytic. That means they, carry, they enable reactions to occur on a quick time scale. And uh, proteins that are catalytic are commonly called enzymes. Okay. And so what I've shown here that you may be familiar from high school biology is the Krebs cycle. It's part of the energy production pathway of the cells carried out in your mitochondria. And here you have uh, listed various um, compounds. So citric acid turns into isotric citric acid, turns into alpha ketoglutaric acid. And each of these steps has an arrow drawn. And at each of those steps, there would be at least one, maybe a series of proteins that are involved in that conversion from one molecule to the next. And so you can see this is just a very small part of the number of catalytic mechanisms that your cell carries out, and yet here you have probably you know, 10, 15 enzymes right there alone. And then finally, 
uh, the last where I point out is signaling. Uh, so here I have two pictures. The first one is the eye. So in the eye, there's actually a protein called rhodopsin, which senses light as it enters the eye. And that uh, causes a structural change to your protein, which then causes a, a signal to be transferred to your optic nerve and allows you to see. Also, with, throughout the body, there's numerous um, what we call a signaling cascades. So you have some sort of signaling molecule that's circulating through the body. There's a receptor on the membrane of your cells that can recognize that signal. And through a change in that protein, it then causes a, chain, a change in the next protein in the chain, which then cascades down in order to affect some cellular response. And that might be to produce a specific type of protein. It might be to tell the cell to move in a certain direction or to grow or to die off. So there's all sorts of different signaling pathways. All right. So how are these uh, protein molecules built up? So their basic building block is called an amino acid. So what you have here is a carbon, uh, what we call the C-alpha carbon at the center. Attached to that is an amino acid, uh, amino group, the NH3, which is positively charged, and a carboxylic acid group, the COO minus. Okay, so it's called an amino acid because it has both the amino and acid group. Okay, and then off to the side here, it has this uh, atom that's labeled as R, and what R just stands for is some set of atoms that are attached to the central atom, the central carbon atom. And so what we also often call the same. So in biology, there are 20 common amino acids. And so these are all listed here. And what you could see is the basic structure. So your central carbon at C alpha atom, amino carboxylic acid, and then a branching side chain. Okay. And these side chains provide different properties to that amino acid. So all of these uh, amino acids on the left sort of have hydrophobic side chains. And so when they're in, in a protein, they tend to want to hide from water, OK? Whereas the amino acids on the right have more polar side chains. When they're in a protein, they tend to want to be exposed to water. And what that does is it ends up causing the protein to fold in a certain way, which I'll get to. So proteins are polymers of amino acids. So you can take an amino acid and add another amino acid to it through a reaction and uh, form a peptide bond. So the carboxylic acid binds to the adjacent amino group. Okay. So this would be called a dipeptide. And you can see the side chain stick off of that. And then this reaction can continue. You can see here that you still have an amino, amino group and you still have the carboxylic acid group. So there's nothing that prevents it from adding an additional peptide to the end of this chain and continue growing. So once you get a chain of amino acids, that's called a polypeptide. Okay. And generally, uh, we, the rule of thumb is that you need a polypeptide chain of at least 50 amino acids to be considered a protein. But once you hit that 50 amino acids, you can get very large. So the largest single chain protein has over 300,000 amino acids in a, in a single chain, all connected through peptide bonds. And in addition, proteins may also have more than one polypeptide chain that come together and are tightly associated to form a functional uh, unit. And that's considered a protein as well. Okay. But a protein's function is a result of how the polypeptide chain folds. So what I brought here is a little prop. Uh, this represents the polypeptide chains that make up the signaling molecule insulin. So here we have a 21 uh, amino acid polypeptide chain, and then an additional 30 amino acids on a separate polypeptide chain. And so if you just produce this in the cell and, and had them sitting around as chains, it's not going to really do anything. But what happens is the cell uh, allows the chain to fold up. And so when it folds up, it forms a structure, something like this. And now this can actually carry out a function. And in this case, insulin is a, a signaling molecule. Its shape is very important in that it has a couple of specific bonds, this orange, this yellow, and this green. They're called disulfide bonds that provide it a little bit more um, structure in rigidity. 
uh, also helps prevent it from being degraded in the cell so it can carry out its cloning thing. And then the shape and fold of it is recognized by a specific receptor in the cell. So if it's not folded in this shape, the receptor doesn't recognize it. So the thing to remember here is that with proteins, the, how that polypeptide chain folds up is very important to the function of the cell. Okay. Okay, so even though proteins are large molecules and they can actually be very large molecules, they are still very, very small. So a protein uh, may be on the average of about tens of angstroms in size. So an angstrom is basically the distance between a hydrogen, hydrogen bond. So you have a H2 molecule, that distance between the two hydrogens is one angstrom. Okay, and that's roughly equal to uh, 0 0.1 nanometers, and just as a reminder, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So we're talking about really tiny things. So even an ant that's probably, you know, a millimeter or so long, billions of protein molecules within that. And so in order to visualize things that small, we need special techniques, yes, particularly if we want to see things at an atomic level. Okay. And so that's where X-ray crystallography comes in. It's not the only technique that allows you to get uh, atomic resolution, but it is one of the more common ones and is fairly robust. So now I'm going to just introduce uh, the technique of X-ray crystallography. So if we think about visible light, how do we want to, if we want to see something small, what might we do? Well, we might use a magnifying glass, okay? So an ant's fairly small. If we want to see details of the ant, we need to make the image bigger. So we use a magnifying glass, okay? The problem of using this with uh, a protein molecule is demonstrated by this. So this is a, a piece of wood. It's 36 inches long. It's not marked. So if I wanted to use this stick to measure the width of a penny, you can see that it's going to be very difficult for me to determine exactly how wide that penny is. Okay. And what this, the analogy with light is, so light has a wavelength from about 400 to 800 nanometers. So if I'm trying to visualize a protein that's only 1 to 10 nanometers across, and I'm using a light that's 400 to 800 nanometers, I'm just not going to be able to do it at any sort of resolution. So what sort of light do I need in order to visualize that 1 to 10 nanometers? Now this is a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum running from radio waves, which can be uh, over 10 meters long, all the way down to gamma rays. And if we look in here for that 1 to 10 nanometer region, that shows up there, and that's about the size of atoms. Okay? So x-rays are the wavelength of light that's on the correct order for visualizing atomic bond lengths. Okay? So obviously, we just want to make a magnifying glass that works with x-rays. Okay? So where do we get the x-rays from? Well, that's where the advanced photon source comes in, all right? Again, this big facility, its entire job is to make x-rays. And the way it, so there's, the primary way you can make x-rays is to get an electron moving and then change its momentum. So when you're sitting in your dentist's office and he goes to take a uh, x-ray of your teeth, that machine, what it does is it provide, it creates an electric, uh, charge across a gap that promotes electrons move from a cathode to an anode. And when it hits the anode, all of a sudden, that's a solid object, that electron stops. So you've changed the momentum by changing the velocity. Okay? In synchrotrons, it works a little bit differently. In this case, the way you change the momentum, because if you remember from uh, physics, momentum is a vector, so it has both a magnitude, the velocity, and a direction. If you change the direction that electrons are moving, so in this case, when that's, uh, in the advanced photon source, they move in a circle around the ring, you would generate x-rays. Okay? And there's two devices in the ring that generate x-rays. One's called a bending magnet, and the other one's called an undulator. Okay? So these are just pictures of those two. Uh, up top in red is the bending magnet. Uh, basically, just think of it as a large magnet with a little gap in between the north and south pole 
and as the electron beam passes through, that magnetic field then bends the orbit of the electrons around. And you get X-rays coming out the front. Okay? These are used in the synchrotron ring to get those electrons to turn in that circular orbit. So if you didn't have those, the electrons just go straight. So these produce uh, X-ray radiation, but uh, the undulator, what it does is it has a series of magnets that alternate poles. And so as the electrons pass through, there's a local perturbation back and forth of the electron beam. And each time that happens, it produces a little bit of, of X-rays, and they kind of cascade up and, and produce a really more intense beam than you would get with the bending magnet. So we go back to our uh, analogy with the magnifying lens. So if we have a small object, we want to see details, we, put a, we shine light on it, and we use a lens to focus that up and project an image. Okay? So obviously that's what we're going to do with x-rays, right? Well, there's a problem. So x-rays are the right wavelength to see these small objects, but there are no lenses that allow you to refocus the x-rays to re-image, to, to get the, blown, the uh, expanded image. So what we have to do is we have our X-ray source. We can put it through a number of different optics that allows us to select the wavelength that we want to use for the X-rays and focus it down to hit the crystal. And when it hits the crystal, there's a couple of things that happen. Some, some, most of the X-rays through the crystal. Okay, so most of them pass right through. Some of them will be absorbed by the crystal. But some of the other x-rays are scattered by the crystal. And so that's demonstrated by these rays kind of coming off at an angle. And so then if you put an x-ray sensitive detector downstream of the crystal, you can capture that diffraction pattern. Okay. So this picture just shows you one of our x-ray detectors that we have. And I just wanted to show you, give you a idea uh, of the scale that we work with. Um, and this entire shiny surface here is sensitive to x-rays. That shiny part isn't, but right behind it is, is the surface that's sensitive to x-rays. And this allows you to convert that, the diffracted x-rays into an electrical signal that you can measure and create an image from. Okay. So I sort of snuck in there that you have to have a crystal in order to do x-ray crystallography. So exactly what is a crystal? Crystals are a regular packing of things, and it can be anything. You could pack couches into a crystal. You can pack mice into a crystal, although they probably wiggle out. Uh, so here's an example of two two-dimensional crystals. So these are drawn by the famous artist uh, M.C. Escher. Um, and here you see on the left uh, these fish that are packed close together. Um, and so what you can see about a crystal is it's closely packed together and all the uh, objects that are packed are sort of arranged with a certain orientation with respect to each other. And so, in fact, if you connected all of the eyes together to form a box, you could regenerate the rest of that picture by translating that box and everything in it to different positions on the screen. And that would allow you to build up the entirety of that, that picture. And so that's sort of the basic idea of a crystal. So crystals have to have translational symmetry. They can also have rotational symmetry. So here, over here with the spiders, you can see that there's a rotational symmetry here so that if you rotated by 60 degrees, this spider would overlap with this spider here. Okay. But the basic principle still remains. You're closely packing things together, and they have some uh, structural orientation with respect to each other. Okay. So we're familiar with crystals in our everyday life. So sodium chloride crystals, this is your standard table saw. Everybody's seen that. So over on the left is an uh, enlarged image of what those look like, individual grains, closely packed atoms. On the right shows the actual packing of the sodium and chloride crystals. So the sodium are the small purple balls and the chlorine are the larger green balls. And you can see that the packing of those atoms is reflected in the shape of the crystals. So these atoms pack closely together in sort of a cubic shape. And in fact, the large crystals are cubic as well. Okay. And so the internal symmetry of the crystal is reflected in the external sy symmetry of the crystal. Well, not only do salts crystallize, but so do proteins. And so we can generate crystals of proteins. And this is just a random sampling of 
what those crystals can look like. Uh, and these are relatively small. So um, saw crystals, you can probably see an individual saw crystal with your naked eye. So maybe you know a millimeter or a tenth of a millimeter across. These crystals tend to be from 10 to 100 microns across, depending on the crystal. Some crystals grow bigger, some crystals grow smaller. So all of these are being visualized through a microscope in order to, to see them. Okay. So go back to our image of our crystal. Shines x-rays on our crystal. That scatters the x-rays, which is picked up by a detector. And this can take up to tw 20 to 100 meters to pack all of these instrumentation in, into a space. Okay? And so that's what's called the, the beam line. So when you shine x-rays through a crystal, you can collect a pattern that looks like this. This is called the x-ray diffraction pattern. All right, it's got a couple of features to it. Uh, most immediate, what you see is it's a uh, array of spots. You can see they're individual spots. They're regularly spaced. They have some sort of sense of order to them, right? They have specific locations, and they vary in intensity. So you can see here are some really dark spots. Here's a dark spot, and right up here is a light spot that you may not even be able to see uh, from a distance. So you have a location. You have a uh, intensity. And these x-rays are scattering in three dimensions. So even though we're catching them with a two-dimensional detector, they're actually scattering all around the crystal. And so in order to complete the array of spots, what we do is we rotate the crystal in the x-ray beam. And that allows us to collect a series of these images to build up our data set. Okay. And then we use uh, some computer programming. So each individual spot gets assigned a specific address. And this, we, use the letters H, K, and L to tell us where those are. And it gives an intensity that's recorded. Okay. And that's the basic data that we use to reconstruct our atomic models. So in order to get that molecular image, we must use a 3D Fourier transform. So basically, what a Fourier transform allows you to do is you can take a periodic function, in this case the electron density, so remember it's a crystal, so it periodically repeats its pattern, okay? And you can represent that periodic function has a summation of periodic functions. In this case, the periodic function is the uh, appearance or disappearance of these spots, okay? And so this is sort of a complicated uh, equation if you're not familiar looking at it, but I'll just kind of walk you through what it has. So the result that we get is electron density, and that's because the x-rays are actually interacting with the, elect uh, the electrons of the atoms, okay? And this is good because if we know where electrons are, even though they're not speci specific to a uh, specific point in space, they form sort of an electron cloud around the nuclei of atoms. So if I know where the density of the electrons is high, it's a pretty good chance that that's where my atoms are located, okay? This FHKL, so the F is essentially the intensity of the spots, and the HKL is just saying that I'm going to take the intensity of each of those spots and add them into this equation. So I need all the, as many spots as I can get in order to get an accurate electron density map. Uh, and then this term is called the phase. So if you remember, with a wave, you have both the intensity and you have a phase to it, how it fits on y-axis. The crystallography experiment allows us to measure that intensity, but we can't measure the phase directly. So that's called the crystallographic phase problem. And most of our effort on the experimental side, once we have the crystals, once we have the machine, is trying to solve this phase problem. And there's various techniques that we use, uh, but I'm not going to go into those because uh, they get fairly complicated. But once you solve that, you can throw that into the equation and you can calculate electron density. So the beauty of the 3D Fourier transform is that you don't have to get all of this data to get an interpretable electron density. As you get more and more data contributing, the accuracy of this prediction for the electron density gets more accurate. But even if you only have a partial data set, you can get some information out of it.
Okay. So we get an electron density map at the end. All right. So once we calculate that, we can build up our model of the protein. So we, this is where the crystallographer sits down at their computer, uses a little graphics program that allows us to sort of put together the model as a jigsaw puzzle, fitting it into the electron density. And we utilize our knowledge of basic amino acid structure as well as basic protein structure in order to interpret it correctly. So just as an example, this is a small section of electron density from a protein that I've worked on. And you can see that there's sort of these little spheres of higher density, and that's where electro, uh, the atoms are going to be placed. So we can take this electron density, and we can build in an atomic model. Okay. And with this atomic model, now I can go in and I can look in depth at proteins specifically to see how they fold together, well, what sort of chemistry they can carry out if they're an enzyme, uh, how they might function as a transporter, those kind of things. So this next slide is just showing you various ways that crystallographers use to represent a protein once they have the model. Okay? So this first one's called a space filling model. The colors are based on the atom type that's represented. So carbon is in gray, nitrogen is in blue, and oxygen is in red. Okay? And it's called a space filling because these spheres are drawn with a radius that's uh, relative to the size of the actual atoms. So a carbon atom has a size relative to nitrogen, and they vary in size, and those are drawn here. Okay. So that's a space filling model. Okay. We can also change the color. We're not restricted to using those colors. So in this case, we've colored all of the molecules associated with the protein, the polypeptide chain, in this dark blue color. And that allows us to see that, hey, there's something else bound into this protein. And this is, that, in fact, a heme cofactor. It contains an iron atom at the center of that. And that's where, so myoglobin is found in muscles, and it's used to store oxygen for when you exercise, that oxygen's readily available. And so this iron on the heme allows it to bind to oxygen. So we can use color to, to highlight specific parts of a protein. And it doesn't have to be just you know, all protein atoms. I can go and look at specifically, uh, maybe I want to see which uh, residues, which amino acids are hydrophobic, and where are they located. Okay, this representation is called the, the licorice model. And basically what you have here is at each vertex, vertex or uh, endpoint is the center of an atom, and it's colored, coded based on the type of atom. Uh, so this is a way that you can see all of the atoms for a large area in one glance. And it can get a little complicated if you have the full thing up here, especially if you want to try and figure out depth. But it also allows you to zoom on specific parts of a protein to kind of see the details going on. Uh, there's another representation, which I don't have shown, that's called ball and stick, which is similar to the licorice. Uh, so the licorice is essentially just highlighting the bonds between atoms, whereas a ball and stick at each center of the atom, it would put a small ball uh, to highlight those. Okay. So that sort of allows you to see all the atoms at one point. But remember, a protein's made up of a polypeptide chain. Each poly, uh, amino acid has a, a C alpha carbon. And so one of the ways you can see how the chain is, is uh, sort of folds in on itself is to just represent each C alpha atom has a point and then connect those together. And this is C alpha trace. Okay. And this allows uh, a crystallographer to see at one glance sort of the overall fold of how that polypeptide peptide chain folds up on itself. But you can see, this is not, not the prettiest picture, so we'll use what's called a cartoon representation. And in this case, rather than just drawing flat, uh, straight tubes connecting the atoms, we kind of interpret this as a ribbon and allows us to follow the polypeptide chain. And this uh, cartoon really highlights specific, uh, what's called secondary structure. So in this case, in myoglobin, it has these helices throughout the protein called alpha helices. And so by using the cartoon representation, I can easily see where those alpha helices are much uh, more clearly than from this representation. Okay. And then the final representation I'm going to show is the surface representation. So the way you would generate this is in the computer, uh, you take a theoretical 
uh, atom that's about the size of a uh, water molecule. So somewhere, you know, five to six angstroms wide, and you sort of roll it around the surface of your space filling representation. Okay? And what this shows is now what surfaces of the protein are actually accessible to smaller molecules like water molecule or an ion or the cofactor that's bound in. And so this is a nice way of seeing uh, pockets inside the protein where molecules might bind. Okay. So once a crystallographer gets a model, they want to share this with other researchers that might be interested in this. And so what they do is they go to what's called the Protein Data Bank, and it's located at this uh, website, rcsb.org, okay? And they deposit the coordinates for their structure. And so this is publicly available to anyone who wants to go to this website. They can go in and they can search for a specific protein or other biological molecule that's been solved, and they can download the, the model and use it to interpret their own data that they're getting in their lab. Uh, it's got a number of uh, features that they have on this website. Every month they have a sp specific molecule of the month that they highlight. So this month it was isoprene synthase. <coughs> and you can click on this and it just gives you sort of a general background for that specific molecule and, and sort of some of the highlights of this, its structure. Um, PDB 101. It's sort of a learning tools are, are located. So this uh, paper model of insulin I downloaded from that PDB 101. All right. And they have some other features. And then just uh, more detail. So this is uh, an example of what a entry for a specific protein would look like. So this is the same myoglobin model that I had shown you previously. Uh, and so on here it has links where you can view it in 3D uh, within your actual web browser. You can download files here. It also has information about who uh, deposited the structure. Uh, it'll have information on their experiment that they used to solve that structure, and then uh, the citation within the scientific literature so you can find out uh, more information about it. Okay. All right, this slide. Uh, so there's, over, there's thousands and thousands of structures in the PDB. And so I just wanted to give you a favor. So one of the things they have at the PDB website is this poster called the Molecular Machinery. And just sort of uh, highlights a few of the critical structures uh, for life. So sort of over on here on the right are proteins uh, related to DNA synthesis and maintenance, as well as RNA synthesis. Uh, these proteins are all involved in protein synthesis. Uh, this is called a microtubule. This is a structural protein that sort of uh, creates the scaffolding within cells. This group here is uh, actin and myosin fibers. So these are the fibers that make up your muscles. Right? And then over on the left, these are just various uh, membrane proteins. So down here are photosynthetic proteins. These are various transports and pumps. Uh, these are all involved in energy production within the cell. These are various enzymes, and so on and so forth. So you can see there's a, a wide variety of proteins that are deposited in the data bank, and they have a wide variety of structures. Uh, so to give you a, a more uh, intimate look at perhaps some of your questions you can ask with a protein structure, I'm going to now switch gears and, and talk about some research that I've done with some collaborators at Louisiana State University. Okay. So this uh, protein here is called... 8R lipoxygenase, and it's from a coral called Plexora homomala. Okay. Lipoxygenases are a class of enzymes that contain an iron cofactor. Uh, they're found in plants, they're found in fungus, they're found in animals, and they're found uh, in mammals. In mammals, they play a role in inflammation response. Okay. So it has an iron cofactor and it catalyzes the dioxygenation of arachidonic acid. So this is a, a model of arachidonic acid. It's a fatty acid, contains four double bonds, and it's a 20 carbons in length. So I've numbered one through nine, and I've alternated so that I don't like, get too crowded in there. And this enzyme, uh, the iron activates a carbon that then allows oxygen to react to a carbon that's too uh, carbons away. 
So in this example, 8R lipoxygenase, the 8 refers to the carbon where the oxygen is added to the arachidonic acid. Okay. So once we have this model, we can use the surface representation to sort of examine the protein and try and figure out where the arachidonic acid binds. And we already have a clue because we know that iron has to activate the uh, arachidonic acid. So it's going to have to bind somewhere near that iron. But you can see in this view, it, it's not entirely clear where arachidonic acid might fit in. So we can use the surface representation uh, to look at that. And so this is from the, the outside of the protein. And what we can do is we can tell the uh, software to ignore everything that's on, exposed to the outside of the protein, and just show me things that are in cavities or pockets. And so that's what this is here. So you can see kind of in the background this red and green here. Okay. So these two images are zoomed in on the iron showing the, the binding pocket. So this is from the side so you can actually see the iron and then this is sort of turned 90 degrees and the iron is represented by this red spot back here. Okay. And what this shows us is, that, okay, so we know the protein catalyzes the reaction of arachidonic acid with oxygen. So it has to have some way of getting those two molecules together, the arachidonic acid and the oxygen. And in order for the C8 carbon to be dioxygenated, the C10 carbon has to end up near the iron. So, but we have to ask, if we go back to our structure of arachidonic acid, you can see there's two different ends to this protein. You have a carboxylic acid here, and then on the other end, you simply have a methyl group. So, and then this isn't normally folded over like this. This is just to kind of compact the structure. It's actually quite flexible. So you might think of it as a snake, right? Uh, and it is relatively weak. And it could insert into that binding pocket that I showed in one or two ways. Okay? It could go in head first. So if this is the carboxylic acid end, it could insert into that channel this way, or it might insert tail first the methyl group going in first. So one of our first questions with this protein is exactly which way does that uh, arachidonic acid molecule bind, okay? And so what we did is we took our protein and we soaked in arachidonic acid into the crystal and that allowed us to get a model of where the arachidonic acid binds and that's shown here. So first off, the iron is this red area here the C10 is right there, so that's the one that needs to be close to the iron in order to react with that, for the oxygen to react to the C8, okay? And the protein surface is over here. So you can see the way this molecule comes in is it sort of inserts the methyl end, the tail end of the molecule, the inner parts of the protein, okay? So that's interesting, but what we can do further is if we look at other lipoxygenases, so here's the 8R lipoxygenase that I just showed you. This is a, a, another coral lipoxygenase. In this case, it's called 11R lipoxygenase, and shown in salmon. Uh, 12S lipoxygenase is from, uh, isolated from pigs. Okay, and in this case, uh, you can see this sort of structure here has been cleaved off, and that was just in order for the scientists who were doing this crystal that found that that allowed them to crystallize that protein better. And then this final one is uh, human lipoxygenase, uh, 15 LOX2, okay? So all four structures have similar raw shape. And that's what we call homology. So I can actually take the computer program and overlap these structures. And you can see that they overlap quite well. So alpha helices are located where alpha helices are located and beta sheets overlap. And they all have a similar structure. So you might think of this as sort of a little a uh, Scotty dog sitting down. So you got a head here and then the body of it here, right? So they have similar structure and they all catalyze a similar reaction. They all use arachidonic acid. They all use an iron to activate that arachidonic acid and it reacts with oxygen. The difference is where that oxygen gets added, okay? So remember that the number in the name tells you where the oxygen is added. So 8R adds it to the carbon, 8 carbon of arachidonic acid 12 adds to the 12 carbon, and so that's shown here. 
Also remember that I told you that the carbon two atoms from where the oxygen is added is where the iron must be close to. So for eight R lipoxygenase, the C10 carbon needs to be close to the oxygen, to the iron, right? And the same for the 12S lipoxygenase. So in order for the oxygen to react at 12, you need to activate the C10 carbon with the iron. So 8R and 12X should both bind with that C10 close to the iron. And likewise, with 11R and 15X, the C13 carbon should bind close to the iron. Okay, so this gives us a hypothesis. If we look at the binding pockets of these four enzymes, we would expect if they bind in some way with the tail inserting into the channel, that they should have different depths depending on the lipoxygenase. So 8R and 12S, because they need to be near C10 for, that, for the iron, would have a similar depth. But 11R and 15 lipoxygenase would have a shorter depth, although similar to each other, they would have a shorter depth than the 8R or the 12X, 12S. So we can use the model of arachidonic acid bound to the 8R lipoxygenase as a measuring stick for how that uh, arachidonic acid inserts. And so just reminding you, we've used a, a computer program to sort of overlap all these structures. All right. This is our 8R lipoxygenase structure, and this one was based on x-ray crystallography. So we had a crystal that had the protein bound to arachidonic acid, and so this is uh, experimental. We know this is how the So what we can do is we can use this arachidonic acid, if we take this and just transfer it over to those structures that we've overlapped with the 8R lipoxygenase, we can use it sort of as a measuring stick for the depth of this tail end of the binding pocket. So our first example is with the 12S lipoxygenase, and you can see that just the final carbon sticks out of the pocket, okay? But this is a little bit misleading. The depth here is represented by the, sh the fog. And so you can see this little white area here is actually fog. And so there's actually a pocket that sort of extends back into the screen. Um, and if you rotate it around this carbon bond here, this would easily fit into that space. So in this case, the 12XS lipoxygenase and 8R lipoxygenase have similarly sized uh, depth of their arachidonic acid binding pocket. So if we look at the 11R lipoxygenase, uh, first what we can see up here near the head is that the substrate binding pocket actually goes in a different direction. So in this case, if arachidonic acid would bind, it would come in this way and come down. But what we were looking at is the tail end of this uh, arachidonic acid, and we can see that it penetrates out by almost three carbons, which is exactly what we need in order to shift from the C10 to the C13. And then the final one is the 15 lipoxygenase. Uh, again, we see that the lipoxygenase sticks out the bottom of this binding pocket. And so in order for it to accommodate arachidonic acid, it would have to shift up by about three carbons. So this is sort of what we expected to see, and so we've confirmed. So just in summary, we have the depth of the lipoxygenase's binding pocket can determine which carbon of the arachidonic acid is activated by the iron cofactor. Uh, sort of the future studies we would like to do is we'd like to confirm with the structure of other proteins with the arachidonic acid bound to actually show that, yes, arachidonic acid binds the way we expect it to. Uh, and an additional question we have is, does the location of the oxygen addition correspond to where we expect it to be? And in order to do that, we'd have to somehow get oxygen or an oxygen mimic into that active site with the arachidonic acid to confirm that. But we do have an idea in that case. There are some small pockets along the, that binding pocket that look large enough to hold the oxygen, and they're in the right place to, to do that. So that was just a sort of a more example of, of what we can learn from a protein structure. And that's uh, what I have for you today. So. That, that is fantastic. I think I even followed most of the way through, so that's good. <laughs> that's good in a field that I, I was not familiar with and an application of some things that I've studied over time, right, to um, see a, a new field and, um, and open up my eyes as I drive by Argonne every day to come here. 
things that happen. So let's open it up for questions um, from students. And anything about the research itself or about how did you get to this point or you know, school kinds of questions that you may have were open. So raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Um, I wanted to know if your research, like, is, does it help, like, businesses and firms in some way with their products or some way they function? All right. So um, what I didn't really emphasize is that AnyCat, it's, we're a user facility. So the on-site staff is basically there to provide user support for researchers that come from various universities or, or commercial fields. Um, and so even though I have my own research that I'm intimately involved in, uh, there's a lot of other research that I'm peripherally involved in has the just come in to use our equipment that we have on site. And yes, there, there are applications in industry for this, in the medical industry. Um, usually what they're looking for are, there's, there's two things they're looking for. One are unique drug targets, okay? So they might have uh, proteins that they haven't thought about making a drug for that they want to structure to maybe make a for. And then the other one is in drug discovery and refinement. So just like I soaked arachidonic acid into this crystal, you can take a drug molecule and soak it in with the protein target that it has, and you can then examine how does the protein to that drug. And you may see specific residues, uh, amino acid side chains near that drug that haven't been exploited. So there might be a positive charge that points near the drug but your drug doesn't have a negative charge that would correspond to that and make a tighter binding. And so you can use the structure to sort of guide how you want to develop future generations of drugs. And that's probably the, the biggest uh, uh, sort of industry use of this sort of research techniques. Okay. So you studied biology at Purdue. Uh, do you work with mostly other biologists or do you work with uh, physicists as well and computer scientists uh, as a whole or is it mostly just uh, biologists? So we mostly work with biologists, biochemists, biophysics, physicists, okay? And those are broad um, classifications that don't always fit. So my degree is in biology, uh, but a lot of the research that I was doing was more biochemical research rather than a biology research. Uh, they're really just titles and the departments vary. Some universities, this sort of technique would fall into the biology department. Other universities, for Cornell, for example, it's actually in the chemistry department where they do x-ray crystallography. And so it just depends on the university. And I should also say that this uh, technique of x-ray crystallography is not restricted to protein. Visualize other biological molecules, so RNA and DNA have both been visualized with X-ray crystallography. But you can also visualize small molecules. Sodium chloride was the first crystal structure that was solved with X-ray crystallography. So you can do small, very um, type molecules all the way up to large proteins. Anything in between works. If you can crystallize it, you can use this technique. Other questions? All right, going once, going twice. How about a final round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>